Recently, we've been thinking about intermolecular forces and how those impact the properties of liquids, but now we're gonna take a brief look at the properties of solids. We're gonna look at four different types of solids. The first is ionic solids. These are things that are made of a bunch of ionic bonds. They're things like sodium chloride or potassium fluoride. Anytime you have an ionic compound and you have a bunch of it together, you're gonna to get an ionic solid. We're gonna look at metallic solids. That's just when we have a chunk of metal. So here are represented a bunch of copper atoms, for example. So you just have a bunch of copper metal atoms next to each other, they're gonna form a metallic solid. So any solid metal you see would fall in that category. A molecular solid is basically something that we've frozen. So this turns out to be a bunch of CO2 that's stacked close together. So if we had frozen CO2, that would be like dry ice and that would make a molecular solid. It's just where we have a bunch of molecules that we've condensed into the solid phase. And then lastly, we have covalent networks, which are maybe the most unique here. And in this case, it's like one big super molecule where all of them are connected by covalent bonds. So we have a bunch of atoms and they're all connected by covalent bonds. Common examples here would be like diamond or graphite. Okay, now let's take a look one at a time of these different solids and look at their properties. First, ionic solids. Ionic solids are made of a bunch of ionic compounds. And so if we imagine that our purple spheres here represent our cations and our green spheres represent our anions, then we have alternating positive and negative charges. And that's what holds these solids together. They're held together by ionic bonds. So that's the main force of attraction. Okay, so they're held together by ionic bonds. They have very high melting points. And we can actually understand that based on the structure. Remember, if I'm gonna melt this thing, what's gonna happen is it's gonna start to flow around. All of these atoms are gonna start to flow around easily, right? And what that means is that our negatively charged things are gonna flow around next to other negatively charged things and positively charged things are gonna to have to flow around next to other positively charged things. So to get that to go to a liquid phase where they all float around all loosey-goosey next to like charges is gonna take a lot of energy because things don't like to be around similar charges. Like charges, remember, repel. So they have a high melting point. Okay, another thing that we should know about ionic compounds is that they're brittle. What that means is they fall apart easily. So they break apart easily. They're not malleable. So if I try to change the shape of it, let's say I try to hammer it into a flat sheet, it'll just fall apart. And the reason is, let's say I come along, this is my hammer, so I hit it with a hammer. It's a pretty bad hammer, but we'll go with it. And this whole layer of ionic compounds, let's say, shifts down one. Okay, so we've dropped our whole layer of ionic compounds down one. That disrupts the structure and breaks the bonds because then these two atoms would be next to each other and these two atoms would be next to each other. And then once again, we get these positive and positive charges next to each other and these negative and negative charges uh, next to each other and they would fly apart. Okay, uh, they're also conductive when melted. So if I do actually heat them up really hot so that they melt, then I have a liquid of charged ions and the mobility of those ions allows them to conduct electricity. Okay, last property is that these ionic compounds are often soluble in water. So salt dissolves in water. L oftentimes ionic compounds dissolve in water. When they do, we actually get a new cool intermolecular force. So here is an image of our ionic solid dissolving in water. And what happens is each of these individual ions split apart. So for example, you see here that we have the positively charged cation. And that positively charged cation, notice, is surrounded by these water molecules. And the red here is oxygen, and the white is hydrogen. And remember that our oxygen is negatively charged. And so the reason all of these red oxygens have pointed towards that cation is because those are the negative sides of water. Similarly, the negative cation down here has all the hydrogens pointing towards it because hydrogens are positive, and so they're going to point towards that negatively charged ion. This attraction between water and those ions has a special name. It's called an ion dipole force. So when ionic solids are put into water, some of them dissolve. When they do, they split apart. We call that dissociating. And that dissociating, that, fall apart, that falling apart of those ions allows a new intermolecular force to form. And we call that the ion dipole force. So remember, our list of intermolecular forces are dispersion, that's all molecules, dipole forces, that's from polar molecules. Hydrogen bonds, that's molecules with H directly bonded to O. Ion dipole is a new category of intermolecular force that happens when we put an ionic solid into water, into any polar compound. We get this dissolved ionic polar compound mix, like we see over here. 
and that's called the ion dipole force. It's the attractive force between the ion and the dipole of that polar molecule. Importantly, the ion dipole is the strongest of our intermolecular forces. The strength still increases as we go down this list. So what that means is, if you mix together an ionic compound with something that's polar, you get a new intermolecular force, the ion dipole, and it's the strongest one. Okay, so that's some about our ionic solids. Let's talk briefly about our metallic solids. Here's what happens in our metallic solids. Each one of these atoms that we see over here gives up an electron. So let's represent our electron with a purple dot. And our purple dot goes off and it can float anywhere around. So all of these atoms give up an electron and they can all flow freely through this whole solid. And so these roaming electrons are what holds my solid together. It also turns out that these roaming electrons, for reasons we won't get into, make it shiny. Those roaming electrons do a really good job of reflecting light. They're also, metallic solids are also highly conductive. They conduct electrical currents well and heat well, right? Why do they conduct electrical currents well? Well, remember, we have all these free electrons. And so if I have a free electron that can roam to the left or to the right, then that can conduct electricity really easily. It also conducts heat really easily. Turns out that's related to the structure as well. So you might notice that if you put metal into contact with something warm, it gets warm really fast. They're also very malleable in contrast to ionic compounds. If I hammer my copper into a flat sheet, those electrons can still roam through it and still hold it together. Okay, now let's look at a molecular solid. A molecular solid is made of molecules, not surprising there. And what holds it together are intermolecular forces. So the particular forces that hold a molecular solid together depend on what intermolecular forces I have. Here, we've already said that this is just a block of CO2. CO2 is nonpolar, so it would just be dispersion forces holding this together. But if you had a molecular solid of water, which we would call ice, it would be hydrogen bond holding it together. These tend to have low melting points because my intermolecular forces are weaker than my intramolecular forces. So the intramolecular forces like metallic bonds or covalent bonds or ionic bonds do a really good job of holding things together. Here, we can melt them quite easily because we're only breaking those dispersion or dipole or hydrogen bond forces. They're not conductive, and that's because they don't have electrons hanging out that are free, and so molecular solids don't conduct electricity. Okay, last category is our covalent network. These are solids held together entirely by covalent bonds. Okay, so here is diamond. Diamond turns out to just be carbon, which is kind of surprising. But what happens is over and over again, you have four carbons bound to your single carbon in the center there, and it's just covalent bonds through the whole thing. Okay, so that means that they're very, very hard to pull apart, it makes them very, very hard. Here we have silicon dioxide, that turns out to be sand, and again, we just have covalent bonds through the whole thing. Okay, lastly, silicon carbide, which is a very hard material sometimes used in like saw blades. And again, it's a covalent solid, a bunch of covalent bonds holding it together. So when I think about these covalent network solids, the main attractive force is covalent bonds. They're exceptionally hard, like diamond. They're not conductive because they don't have free electrons and they have very high melting points because if you wanna melt them, you have to break those covalent bonds. So think about melting a diamond, not too easy. Okay, so those are some properties of different solids. Basically, you should just write down those properties of these different types of solids and make sure you memorize them and are able to answer questions like this. Classify each substance in the table as either metallic, ionic, molecular, or a covalent network solid. So let's take a look at these. Substance X is brittle and white. It has a melting point of 800C. It's conductive if melted, and it's soluble in water. Okay, well, remember, what's brittle? What's conductive when melted? What's soluble in water? All of those have to do with ionic compounds. So this is an ionic solid. Okay, compound Y is shiny, malleable, has a melting point of 1100 C. Its electrical conductivity is high and it's insoluble in water. Okay, what was malleable and had high conductivity? That was a metallic solid. So metals are malleable and have high conductivity. Okay, lastly, compound Z is hard and colorless it has a melting point of 3,500 degrees Celsius, super high, with no electrical conductivity. So that is a covalent solid. Okay, lastly, we have this question. Substance X is dissolved in water. What intermolecular forces are present and which one's the strongest? Okay, well, substance X is ionic, and if we dissolve it in water, then there's obviously going to be dispersion forces there because we have the water 
And when we dissolve it in water, we'd also have dipole forces because water is polar. And we'd have hydrogen bonding because water has hydrogen bonds. But the new thing that we've really added from this lesson is that when we mix an ionic compound like substance X with water, we get this new intermolecular force, ion dipole. And that will definitely come up again. So make sure you remember that. So which one's the strongest? Well, ion dipole is our strongest intermolecular force.